vamos a comenzar con nuestro último, last but not least, eh, conferenciante. Eh, es eh, mi buen amigo Fernando Martín. Nosotros también compartimos cosas, no el pueblo, pero sí el apellido. Y la química y la física teórica en España es una de las grandes disciplinas. Tenemos unos científicos de primer nivel, eh, pero... Entre ellos destaca especialmente Fernando Martín, es uno de los teóricos más brillantes que tenemos en nuestro país, ha hecho muchísimas cosas, en un par de minutos que voy a hacer la presentación no puedo decir mucho más, pero sí eh, decir que ha creado pues, un máster, un grupo de investigación espectacular, que está vinculado a la Universidad Autónoma, que está vinculado a la Indea Nanociencia de forma muy, eh, muy profunda y... Y decir algo sobre su biografía, muy brevemente, él es eh, producto de la Universidad Autónoma, en todos los sentidos, donde ha hecho su carrera, pero no penséis que esto no ha estado, ha estado exento de una, eh, digamos, larga trayectoria y brillante trayectoria científica eh, postdoctoral, eh, estando primero en Burdeos, eh, posteriormente en París 6, que es eh, eh, París, la Universidad de Pierre y Marie Curie, que yo creo que a partir de 2017 se ha, se ha unido a la Sorbona, haciendo una de las universidades más prestigiosas a nivel mundial. En estas dos universidades francesas él estuvo más vinculado al mundo de la física y luego también con postdoc en la Universidad de Chicago. Eh, estas tres estancias postdoctorales le han hecho tener una visión pues, seguramente muy avanzada de lo que es la ciencia a nivel internacional y que luego supo, supo plasmar muy bien en la ciencia eh, española, haciéndola eh, realmente a altísimo nivel. Eh, la verdad es que, bueno, decir de, de Fernando, pues que es un autor prolífico, como teórico tiene del orden de unas 500 publicaciones, sus eh, números son muy buenos, y, y decir eh, un par de cosas para terminar su presentación, porque yo creo que es de sobra conocido, la primera vez que está aquí en, en, en el ICEMOL, pero seguramente no será la última. Y decir de él, pues que, bueno, es eh, dos cosas, voy a decir, importantes que le han pasado este año. Una de ellas es que, eh, es, bueno, aún no es, pero está, ha sido ya eh, nominado como como doctor honoris causa por la Universidad de Estocolmo, digo nominado y todavía no ejecutado por el tema del COVID, pero fue a principios de este año, entonces tan pronto haya ocasión, pues le nombrarán doctor honoris causa por la Universidad de Estocolmo y haciendo el chiste fácil que por lo visto todos hacemos, ya que está en Estocolmo, que se traiga algo más, pero bueno, al, al margen de eso, que hará lo posible desde luego, y camino va de ello, eh, la segunda cosa importante que le pasó, y que en este caso tengo yo algo que ver también, porque eh, a, a finales era, por esta época del año pasado, eh, pues eh, nos comunicaron, para gran alegría y sorpresa nuestra, que nos habían concedido un proyecto Synergy, ERC, y… ¿cómo? No, no se llama tomate, esa es lo que quería aclarar, para que no pase esto lo que acaba de decir Eugenio, que la gente dice tomato y no es tomato, porque lleva doble T, y como sabéis, tomato es con una sola T, lo digo para que a partir de ahora ya digáis tomato, porque tiene que ver con la, eh, la ciencia o la dinámica electrónica en el ámbito del atosegundo, donde él, él es un gran experto. Tengo que decir... Que, que un año atrás este proyecto nos llevó nueve meses a, a Mauro eh, Nisoli de, del Politécnico de Milán, a Fernando Martín, que es el coordinador del proyecto, y a un servidor. Y tengo que decir, siendo honesto, que después de las dos primeras reuniones, todo por Zoom, porque fue el año en, 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 pandémico muy difícil, pues es, yo creo que todos estuvimos pensando, oye, ¿por qué no dejamos esto y nos dedicamos a lo nuestro? Porque... Pero tengo que decir que nueve meses después, que es lo que nos llevó de trabajo a los tres, pues nueve meses después hicimos un proyecto que ni nosotros mismos sospechábamos que podría ser tan sólido, hasta el punto de que la primera vez que pedimos un Synergy nos lo conceden. Con lo cual, es verdad que los tres miembros de este Synergy habíamos disfrutado previamente de Advanced Grand ERC también, con lo cual la tarjeta de presentación era francamente buena. Es eh, una aventura que hemos empezado este año, el 1 de abril, y donde... 
seguramente, bueno, ahora nos va a decir cosas Fernando, él ya tiene magníficas publicaciones en este ámbito. Yo cuando me dijeron el acto segundo, lo primero que pregunté es qué es eso, el, el, como os podéis imaginar, ¿no? Pero, pero él tiene una experiencia, y Mauro, y, y Mauro, Mauro Nisoli también, eh, que es lo que nos va a contar ahora. El problema es que hasta ahora, cuando se irradiaba con estos láseres, eh, pues se producía la ionización de la molécula, y yo creo que es lo que va a contar fundamentalmente, y por primera vez en un equipo único en el mundo, que estará el Politécnico, pues habrá oportunidad de medir eh, el, la dinámica electrónica de los sistemas que definamos, pero en estado neutro. Y nada más, yo creo que he dicho lo más importante, lo demás lo va a decir él y, y bueno, es un gran eh, comunicador también y espero que a partir de ahora eh, ya os refiráis a este proyecto como tomato y no como tomato, ¿vale? Aunque en nuestro anagrama eh, aparezca un tomate, ¿vale? Bueno, eh, en primer lugar eh, quiero dar las gracias a, a Eugenio y a Enrique por invitarme a venir a, a contar lo que hacemos en mi grupo en este superinstituto que habéis montado aquí, que es, es una envidia para todos, incluso viniendo de IMDEA, del cual estamos muy orgullosos, Nazar y yo, pero de verdad es impresionante lo que habéis conseguido en 20 años. Esperemos que IMDEA, cuando cumpla 20, llegue a lo mismo, por lo menos. Um, es un placer siempre venir a Valencia, además siempre que vengo es para cosas buenas, así que uh, <ríe> yo me apunto a venir todas las veces que, que me digáis. Bueno, la charla de la que voy a dar es... Um, so, I'm going to talk about atochemistry. So, atochemistry is a new uh, scientific discipline that was born, as you will see, 10 years ago. And uh, so, it's so, so young that I will not uh, show any uh, synthesis here, uh, and I will not show these big molecules you have been uh, seeing this morning here. Everything will be much more basic. Yeah, sorry, it's my problem. Um, no, I, I move a lot, uh, so that's my problem. So I, I have to... <laughs> so, um, so let me start by defining the attosecond for those who uh, don't know, as Nazario uh, pointed out. Uh, so this is what I explained to him when I uh, met him the first time to propose him this, uh, this project. So the attosecond is uh, 10 to the m minus um, 18 seconds. Okay, and, uh, and this is to a second what a second is to the age of the universe. So uh, that means that uh, well, things that happen in our normal time scale, second is for, you know, things happening at the scale of the other second is like uh, talking about the age of the universe. Uh, so my talk, just to give you an idea, uh, hopefully will take a 2.7, 10 to the 21 uh, other seconds, which is about uh, 45 minutes. And uh, so just to give you uh, uh, the size of the time scale we are considering here. So why this is relevant in chemistry? Well, because uh, maybe I should remind you that electrons, uh, you know, in atoms and molecules, you know, move very fast. And if you take simply the hydrogen atom, you know, and uh, take the uh, Bohr's formulas that you can find in textbooks, you know, in the in high school textbooks uh, or first year of the university degree, and you take this formula, you calculate how long it takes an electron to go around the proton, you will see that it takes 150 attoseconds. Okay, and this is much faster than any other motion in, in the molecule, like, uh, for instance, molecular vibrations that take uh, uh, of the order of uh, uh, tens and hundreds of femtoseconds, and of course much, much, much faster than, uh, you know, molecular rotation, bone breaking, bone forming, etc., etc., which takes uh, picoseconds and much uh, longer times, like uh, nanoseconds. So uh, the, the purpose of photochemistry basically is to have access to this motion in real time. And so for that you have to design, uh, you know, uh, tools that allow you to, uh, to produce movies. 
So during this talk, I will tell you how to make movies. And this has been my job for almost 20 years. I have been making movies, but movies of electrons. And now, with this new collaboration that uh, we started, uh, we hope that these movies will be useful to do some new chemistry, uh, disruptive chemistry, I would say. So what is a movie? In a movie, basically what you want to do is you take pictures of an object in motion, okay? And you take pictures during a very short time interval, okay? And you, uh, this produces a sequence of frames, and then you project these frames one after the other one with very short in time intervals between frames. And this gives you the, uh, the impression of motion. And this is what, how, you know, movies are, are done. So you should remember that uh, then when you make a picture depends uh, uh, the, the, how the object that is uh, moving, how fast it moves in order to decide how long you are going to, uh, to, to, uh, to, uh, to take the picture. So for instance, you, take, you want to take a picture of a little car, you know, going to this uh, slope, and, uh, and you want to take a nice uh, and well-defined picture. For instance, well, you, your shutter speed must be, must be uh, very, very fast. So for instance, a, a four hundredth of a second, and then you get a nice movie. But if you, uh, your shutter uh, speed, you know, is, uh, is lower, then what happens is that you don't take uh, a, a nice picture of this. You know, the, the, the image is fuzzy. You don't see the car very well. Of course, if the shutter speed is even uh, longer, then of course you see that uh, you don't even see the car. So the first thing is that you need, uh, you know, uh, to uh, mm, the time interval during which you take the, the picture must be very short, much shorter than the typical time scale of the motion you want to study. So then in this way, for instance, you do, uh, you, you do things uh, correctly. You want to take a movie of a waterfall, then you can see all the details, you know, all the waterfall, the, 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 the water drops, et cetera, et cetera. If you take the wrong shutter speed, then you know everything is fuzzy, which is nice. It's very artistic, but then you don't have access to the details of what is going on in this motion. So the other important thing is uh, the time interval between consecutive frames. Okay, so if you want to study uh, something that happens very very fast, then the time interval between consecutive frames has to be also very very short. If it is not short enough, then you lose the details. So for instance, you want to take a picture of a drop uh, going to some liquid, and you want to see all the, you know, the splash and all the little details, then you have to, to take, you know, uh, I, I, I think uh, you missed it, but it's you know, 35,000 uh, shots per second, what you have to, to do in order to see this nice motion. So these two concepts must be fulfilled when you want to take a, a you make a, a movie of something at the molecular level. So by the end of the 20th century, people were able to make movies at the, femto, on the femtosecond time scale. This was called femtochemistry, and this was invented by uh, Ahmed Sevail, who won the Nobel Prize in 1999 for this. And so with this time scale, you have access, as I said before, to nuclear motion, essentially nuclear um, vibrations in a molecule. Now, before femtochemistry was established, you know, the time resolution was poorer of the other of the picosecond. And of course, if you wanted to distinguish these two different uh, vibrations, there was no way to do it because you didn't have the time resolution. The images were fuzzy. But with the advent of femtochemistry, of course, you could take pictures of this and then distinguish these motions perfectly. So atochemistry, in fact, is very similar to this, but for electrons. So we want to do the same for electrons. So this is the goal, to make a movie of this motion. But this image is not correct, as you all know, because, you know, we have Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which tell us that, you know, we cannot uh, follow the trajectory of uh, an electron, you know? You cannot know the position and the momentum of, uh, of an electron simultaneously with infinite precision. So in fact, what you have is something like that. So nature is, it's, is in itself fuzzy. So even if you have the time resolution to get the movie, your movie will be fuzzy. And this is not a problem of your 
the way you make the movies is, is nature. So this is something to take into account. We will never see an electron moving along its trajectory. This is forbidden by nature. So how can, how can we make movies? Well, you have to access this time scale. How you can do it? You can do it by using laser pulses that are very, very short in time. And these laser pulses were available at the beginning of uh, this century. And they have been improving on the years. And there are two ways of producing these uh, short laser pulses. Typically, they produce pulses of light of a duration smaller than one femtosecond. And they are produced through the uh, high Horgheim uh, generation process or in uh, free electron lasers, which is kind of electron accelerators, have several kilometers uh, long. And, uh, and then at the end, they go into an undulator that uh, is used to, uh, to produce synchrotron radiation. And the characteristic of this light is not only that it's very short, it's producing very short time intervals, it's also uh, that uh, the light that is produced is produced in the extreme ultraviolet and the X-ray wavelength ranges. Okay, this is the light that uh, is available nowadays to uh, produce pulses uh, of durations smaller than one femtosecond. And the question that arose when these lasers were in place is if they allow us to make the movies we wanted to do and eventually if we could use them to, um, to control this motion in some way. So this is a refreshment for those who are not familiar with the light. Uh, when you have light uh, at a very well-defined wavelength that is there forever, I mean, so it's continu continuous light, then of course, this is associated to a single frequency. So that means that this light is purely monochromatic. It contains a single color, okay? And this is well known by all of you. Now, if you have light, but not in a continuous way, but during a very short time interval, let's say 800 attoseconds, only during this time interval, then if you Fourier transform this thing, then you see that you don't get a single frequency. You have, you know, a lot of frequencies around a mean value. If you are not familiar with Fourier transforms, don't worry. Take Heisenberg uncertainty principle, written in this way, and you know that delta E, the, uh, the uncertainty in the energy, and times the uncertainty in time is of the order of h bar. And that means that if you have light only a delta T interval that is very, very, very small, then delta E is necessarily very, very, very large, which means that the uncertainty of the energy of the photons you have in the light is very large. Or in other words, you have photons of many different energies. So this light is not monochromatic at all. It's very far from being monochromatic. And this is something that uh, one has to take into account. So this light contains many colors. So then this is something you have to take to account. The fact that the light is not monochromatic means that the light, uh, I mean, the, uh, the technical word is that the light has a large bandwidth. These pulses have a large bandwidth. But the other thing that I mentioned is that since this is XUB and X-ray light, then this light, you know, is able to ionize anything, any atom, any molecule, any solid by just absorption of a single photon. You absorb a photon, you are always above the ionization threshold. And this is just a realistic uh, 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 drawing of the uh, potential energy curves of the hydrogen molecule, in which you see that, you know, uh, when you absorb one of these photons, you are well above, you know, the ionization threshold. And uh, this has to be also to, take in, to be taken into account. And finally, although this is probably too technical, I should say that because the frequency of this light is so large, because, you know, it's XUB and X-ray, and X-ray, then that means that, you know, the interaction of this light with matter is very gentle, very, very gentle. That means that the light, the potential, 
that is you introduce by putting this light on the system is much, much weaker than the potential any electron sees in the presence of other electrons or the nuclei. So this is just a perturbation. It doesn't distort the natural potential of your system. And this is very interesting to have access to the natural motion of electrons without any further perturbation. So what is the consequence of not having, co uh, not having monochromatic light? This is a realistic example for the uh, phenylalanine molecule. Here you, hear, you see the orbitals, the orbital energies from the HOMO down to the HOMO minus 31 in the presence of one of these uh, attosecond pulses. And uh, this is the typical bandwidth. So here, you know, this is the range of photon energies that you have in your, in your pulse. And what happens is when you have different photon energies in your pulse, then you have many different photons to be absorbed. For instance, you can absorb a photon of, uh, of a small energy like this one from, let's say, one uh, of the orbitals that are close to the HOMO and produce an electron that escapes from the molecule at the given energy. But at the same time, since you have, uh, let's say, uh, bigger photons, photons of uh, larger energy, you can absorb a photon from one of the inner orbitals of the molecule and lead to an electron exactly with the same energy. So if you, you perform an experiment in which you measure the electron and the kinetic energy this electron has, then you will not be able to tell me where this electron came from. Okay? So this, in other words, is a coherent superposition of states, or in quantum physics, this is called a wave packet, an electronic wave packet. So what you generate, what you generate with an attosecond pulse is not the molecule in a given state, even if it is ionized. No, you generate an electron wave packet, which is not a stationary state. It's something that changes with time. Okay, and this is at variance with all you know phenomena that uh, you know most people are interested in uh, uh, in chemistry so far. Okay, so. Of course, the wave packet is defined by some coefficients that, of course, one has to calculate or one would like to access. I want to emphasize this. I will spend time explaining this concept because otherwise it will be difficult to, to understand the consequence of this. But if you had, let's say, normal light, normal monochromatic light, or you had pulses of light that are very long in duration, that means that the bandwidth would be very, very small or zero, if it is perfectly monochromatic. So you perform the same mental experiment here with this light, then you realize immediately that, you know, it's not the same. I mean, you ionize, let's say, from here. You produce an electron of this kinetic energy. You ionize from here. Since the photon energy is always the same, then you produce an electron with different kinetic energy. So you perform an experiment. You look at your electrons. You look at the energy of the, your electrons, and then by Looking at the energy of these electrons, you know exactly where the electron came from. And this is the basis of photoelectron spectroscopy, for instance. But this doesn't work with attosecond pulses. OK, so let me go back to movies. Now I will tell you how movies are, are done in this field. Well, the way these movies are done is similar to the way they are done in femtochemistry. The difference is that you use an attosecond pulse to, to induce the dynamics in your system. And this dynamics corresponds to the motion of an electronic wave packet. And then you use a probe pulse that you, uh, whose delay with the pump pulse you, you control. And then this probe pulse is used to take pictures of the dynamics generated by the pump pulse at different delta t times. This produces the frames of the movie. At every delta t, you get the frame. OK, and by varying delta t, you get the sequence of frames, then you have the movie. Fine, so let me show you the first ever movie of electronic motion in a molecule. As you can see, this was produced in 2010. This is the movie. Look at it. Probably you don't understand anything. I show it again. 
So let me, let me show it uh, in a different way. I, I will display the frames now, separated. So these are the frames. It's similar to the movie of this horse running. These are the different frames that you take with your camera. OK, so these are the different frames. So, well, not so much to understand. This is a movie of electronic motion in the hydrogen molecule. Now, this movie is the equivalent to the movie produced by Lumiere's Frères, you know, uh, a long, long time ago, in which you saw a train coming to the station. And as you have read this, it is known that people staying, you know, like you here, saw the train and ran away because they were scared that the train was going to go into them. However, I didn't see you running away from this room when I showed the movie of the hydrogen molecule. Okay, why? Well, it's because something that you, you know, you, you have experienced. When you go to a 3D uh, movie, you wear glasses to understand, you know, the movie that is projected in the screen. Now, you forget your glasses, like this lady over here, then you wouldn't see the details of the movie. It would be hard for her to know that these are three dinosaurs running. Now, so probably this lady would say, OK, you know, if looks at this movie, you don't wear the right glasses. Maybe you see dinosaurs over there. But these are not dinosaurs, I can assure you. OK, so, so what's going on? Well, this means that to understand these movies, you need glasses. And these glasses is theory. And so I had to claim here about theory. You know, I'm the only theoretician here, probably. <laughs> and, and it's not just a matter of interpreting what the movie is about. In this field, theory is what is driven, dri driving the development of these movie productions. Okay, by proposing the correct ways of producing these movies. So, what we have to do in practice is to solve this equation. Because we have to do it in a quantum mechanical way. Because we are talking about coherences and electronic wave packets. So, you need quantum mechanics. Forget about classical mechanics. Doesn't work. We have electrons that are ejected, as we have seen. And when you eject electrons, you know, the molecules become cations. And sometimes the cations break because they are not stable. So you have to deal with the motion of electrons that are not bound to the molecule and with nuclei that go apart from each other. And we have to do it in the time domain because we are not talking about stationary states. Is time domain. And this, the only way to do it is by solving the time dependent Schrodinger equation. How do we do it? We go to our lab, which is this one. It has been this, this laboratory for, for several years. This is the Mare Nostrum uh, supercomputer, this, which is in this fancy building. And this is what is inside. And uh, I will not say any detail about the theoretical methods that we use. But we have been developing those, those methods for about 20 years. Because I think you understood from what I said that none of the available quantum chemistry codes or, or atomic and molecular physics uh, uh, quant um, computer codes can give us the solution to this problem. So we had to develop all our computer codes by ourselves. And we run them there. And the other message I want to say is whenever you are aware of a theoretician performing calculations in Mare Nostrum. Now, because you know the environment, you should be sure that these calculations cannot be wrong, OK? Because they are you know, in a place that uh, prevents you to, from being wrong. Anyway, we have also more modest computers in our place. And this is the one we bought with uh, the previous advance grant that we had. And uh, this is basically what we do every day. OK, so now let's go to real stuff. I go back to this movie I showed you before that you didn't understand. 
What happens when you put the glasses on that theory provides? Well, this is what happens. I will not go into the details, but let me say simply that what was plotted here, you see time here, this is time, okay? And what is plotted here is the, what is called the asymmetry parameter, which is the probability of finding the electron when it's on the left proton or when it is on the right proton, this difference divided by the total. For the process in which an electron departs, because we have seen that when you put XUV light there, an electron goes, and then what is left is H2 plus. And what you see here is different colors, and the different colors correspond to positive or negative values of this asymmetry parameter. And what you see is that you change from blue to red, from red to blue, as, and so on. So that means that as a function of time, what you are seeing in real time is how the electron jumps from left to right and from right to left. So this was the first time you could see in real time how an electron moves in a covalent bond. Of course, in the simplest molecule, in this case, H2+. But this is the proof. And this is, of course, you know, theory, experiment, and this is what allowed us to understand these features. So this is basically the movie. Now, H2 has been used uh, in other works that I will not describe here because, you know, these experiments are really complicated. So. For instance, in, in another work that in which we were involved, uh, well, it was discovered that the time an electron takes to escape from a molecule depends not only on its kinetic energy, which is normal. Let's say if the electron has a lot of kinetic energy, it will depart very fast. So the time it will take to leave the molecule will be very small. But it also depends on how much energy, I mean, how, how, what is the position of the nuclei at a given time. And this was less known. Of course, with these tools, people have been able to reconstruct electronic wave packets involving more than one electron. For instance, like in the helium atom, and it's something that we also investigated a few years ago. And by using, you know, physicists like giving exotic names to, uh, to, to some experimental setups, this one is called Rabbit, okay? Uh, but, you know, forget uh, what it is. It's basically the same thing I said, but with more atoms and compulses, one after the other one. And by applying these, uh, you know, experiments, also with the help of theory, we're able to see the birth of the electronic wave packet. Not only how the wave packet moves, but how it is produced, how it, 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 it comes to, to, to your place. And this is, you know, just an example of how this electronic wave packet builds up in time, you know, extracted from experiment, which, by the way, is exactly the same result as you get when you uh, uh, solve the uh, theoretical equations. Okay, helium and H2 is nice. This was very important to show that the tools were ready, that the theory, you know, uh, was also ready. But, of course, this is not chemistry. And I think here I'm surrounded by chemistries, by chemists mainly. So, uh, um, so we thought, okay, you know, people usually forget in chemistry. I mean, in chemistry, I have the impression, I am in the chemistry department, by the way, but uh, and so I'm used to this language. And chemists uh, uh, like, you know, okay, or, you know, reaction occurs because the nuclei separate or form a bond or break a bond or whatever. So it's always nuclei, nuclei, nuclei. Yeah, but nuclei don't do this by themselves. Nuclei follow what the electrons dictate to them. So finally, chemistry is electrons. You know, nuclei do what they are obliged to do. And, uh, and so we wanted to see the effect on molecules. I mean, what, what happens to the time scale in which the electrons move? And then if we understand that, then maybe we will better understand why the nuclei move afterwards and do whatever they want to do. And then we tried this in, uh, in the phenylalanine molecule which is a molecule that Nazario hates, by the way. But he told me this uh, years after we published this. But I don't care if he hated this. I think uh, it was a very nice proof of principle. So in, the, um, in, in a real experiment, what people do is, OK, this is the bandwidth of your atosecond pulse. You ionize phenylalanine. You produce a coherent superposition of states here. And then you can with your prof pulse later on. 
and you ionize further your phenylalanine molecule, of course, this molecule is going to break in different fragments. And what is measured in the experiment is just the, uh, you know, the probability of fragmentation in a given channel as a function of the delay between the pump and the probe pulses. Of course, at this time scale, you don't see anything spectacular. But if you make a zoom there and your time resolution allows you to, you know, yes, to take frames in very short time intervals, then you realize that this is not so smooth. There are, you know, tiny oscillations here. And these oscillations, you know, the period of these oscillations is of the other of two, three femtoseconds. There is no nucleus in, a, in any molecule moving in significantly in two or three femtoseconds. So it was clear that this had to be due to electron dynamics. But what kind of electron dynamics? This is what is not, was not understood. So what we did is just to represent the first step, which is, you know, the production of the electronic wave packet by the attosecond pulse and see how this electronic wave packet evolves in time because this, is, this was certainly the reason for these oscillations. And this is what we did, and this is what we obtained. So this is the actual electron wave packet generated by the attosecond pulse. And the different colors indicate excess or default of charge with respect to the average charge of the cation that is left after ionizing the phenylalanine molecule with the attosecond pulse. And then being a chemist, you would say, okay, here you have, you know, this uh, NH2 terminal. And uh, you would say, well, this can be a donor, this can be an acceptor, depending on the environment, but you are one thing or the other in general. Well, not, at, not here, not at the attosecond time scale. You know, sometimes there is an excess of charge, sometimes there is a default of charge. So the color changes with time and changes very, very rapidly. So how should we interpret chemistry at this time scale? I don't know. This is something we have to learn. So we can look at these charge fluctuations around this uh, amino group, for instance, that are like this, and then make a Fourier transform and calculate the typical frequencies of, this, uh, of these fluctuations. And these are the typical frequencies, and this is what was measured. I had to say that, of course, the agreement was not perfect because, you know, uh, there's a lot of things going on here. And, of course, because the theory is not able to say anything at very short time intervals where the pumps and the probe pulses overlap in time, and we were not representing the probe step in these calculations. But you leave these things apart. Let's say the gross features are very well caught by the theory. So this was the proof that the frequencies that they saw in this experiment occurring in the uh, range of two, three femtoseconds, you know, were due to the, this electronic motion. And the same happens, for instance, for tryptophan that we investigated a few years later. Now, by refining a little bit the, um, the theoretical description, by, um, by inc incorporating in some way the fact that the nuclei move. But, you know, basically nothing changes because, you know, nuclei move, uh, you know, are very slow. So by the time the nuclei want to do something, well, the electrons did whatever they had to do already. And they almost finished. Okay, now an interesting point about this is that if we can control electron dynamics at this time scale, maybe we can change reactivity. You can change the way molecules behave naturally. And so we have been playing with glycine to do this because it's a smaller molecule. And of course there was no experiment, so this is just a theoretical you know, prediction. And just to tell you that just by playing with the, the, uh, the central frequency of the attosecond pulse that you use, you can generate two different uh, electron dynamics in this particular case. As you can see here, you know, the frames, these are the frames of, the, of your movie, are very different to the frames you have here. Uh, and so what is the consequence of this? Well, to understand the consequence of this, that what we did is to to calculate how the nuclei move afterwards in the presence of this electronic wave packet. And then what we found is that indeed you can control this thing because if you use this pulse over here, then you favor the uh, breaking of the CN bond, which is that these red lines, you know, this is the CN bond distance and you see how this increases with time. Or you can favor the breaking of the CC bond 
which is the blue line here. And this, you can do it only by changing the characteristics of your attosecond pulse. So there is hope that by using these, these uh, uh, attosecond pulses, you can indeed induce new chemistry, you know, or you can control it the way you want. Now, but the question is, do we really see electrons in all the movies I showed you? Well, I told you, yeah, this is the electron dynamics. We see it because we are theoreticians and we solve the time dependence Schrodinger equation. But this is not what the experiment observed. The experiment is this. This is just a reconstruction, you know? I mean, you say that this is compatible with this, but this does not show the electrons in motion. The same about this. This was the H2 problem I mentioned. I told you, okay, this is represents the jumping of the electron from left to right and from right to left, how an electron moves in a covalent bond. Yeah, but this is not what is measured directly. What is measured is this. So, you mean, this is because it's based on normal spectroscopic methods. So you, you, you assume that if, with the help of theory, you might reconstruct the spectra that you get and obtain the electronic wave packet. But you are not seeing the electrons in reality. Is there any way to see, you know, electron density at the Angstrom time scale, which is what you would need in order to see with your own eyes, you know, the electrons? Yes, this is well known. Scanning tunnel microscopy. This is a very well established tool. Of course, there is no time resolution here. It's totally stationary. But this allows you, for instance, to see the homos and the lumos of, of uh, very complex molecules. For me, this is a very complex molecule. You know, it's TCNQ, um, which is tetracyano, um, whatever, TCNQ. Okay, and, uh, and well, this is just yes, a calculation of the, uh, uh, you know, electronic density at different bias voltages. And this is an experiment performed at Indian Nanoscience, in which you see for the first time uh, mm, here my friend, uh, <laughs> uh, but it was totally stationary. And then you can see that, uh, you know, um, well, it's incredible, you know, the resolution you can achieve with STM, okay? So the idea was why should not combine attosecond science and STM? Is it possible? Because this would provide simultaneously temporal resolution at the attosecond scale and spatial resolution at the Angstrom scale. And this would give you the movie. This would mean that you don't need theory anymore because you see with your own eyes the electron, then I can't retire. So I think it's, you know, it was a good project. That it was one of the projects I was uh, trying to address in the last few years. And in fact, this has been realized. And this is a paper that has been just accepted. Uh, so it's, uh, it's not yet, uh, in, these are uh, parts of the proofs which shows this is an experiment on PCTDA molecules. A again, don't ask me the name, but these are, these, these are the molecules that are deposited on gold and the presence of STM, and you have a pump probe. In this case, the pump probe uh, pulses are not in the XUB because if you put XUB here, you start uh, ejecting electrons from the gold surface, and then you see nothing, okay? You only see electrons coming from gold. So it was infrared. But it doesn't matter. They, they were very short infrared pulses, and the principle was the same. Pump probe, you know, with time resolution of the other of attoseconds. You vary the delay, etc. And then the interesting thing is that for the wavelengths that were chosen, you know, it was possible to induce oscillations between the home of the molecule and the surface state of gold. And so, and these oscillations, of course, the populations oscillate with time, and then the idea was to check if it was indeed possible by using this device to see the electron density at different delays between the pump and the probe and see if this reflects in some variation. And of course, it does. And here you can see, you know, this is basically the HOMO, what you see when the delay is zero femtoseconds. And then as the delay increases, these are the different frames of your movie, you see that the homo disappears and then it goes to the surface state. So you see this yellow thing here going around the molecule. 
Okay, this is, you see this around the molecule because it's gold that is below. And then you don't see, it should be yellow everywhere, but the molecules are hiding, you know, the, uh, the surface state uh, when they are on top of the surface. So you only see it around the molecules. And then later on, you know, it goes back to the same thing. So this is perfect oscillation in time. And in fact, if you just integrate over a given size here, you see these oscillations perfectly, okay, of both states. And just to give you how simple it is to interpret this, so we derive a simple analytical formula like this one, in which we inserted here, you know, values that were calculated by using our methods, and this perfectly fits the, um, the observation. So this is the proof that now it is our reach, is, it is within our reach to observe directly electron dynamics uh, without reconstruction. Of course, you need a solid substrate for this, and this is not going to be a universal method because you have to avoid removing electrons from your surface and from your tip in the STM. And this is not easy. So that means that this prevents you from using you know, high frequencies. And so there are many processes you will not be able to access, but it shows that you can do it. The other question, and this is the one that Nathalie referred in his presentation is, okay, fine, but uh, in the examples I showed you before, um, we were ionizing molecules, and it was unavoidable because you know, we, we, these are the only pulses that were available, you know, XUB and X rays. Is there any way to do atochemistry without ionizing the molecules? This is just, just an example where, you know, uh, where no, where, I mean, there is no ionization here. The natural light excites molecules, okay? And then these excited molecules do whatever they want. They make reactions, and some of them are so important, like this one. Well, the answer is, Yes, it would be possible if you could design a pump pulse in the UV or the visible. Of course, this pulse cannot have at a second duration, simply because the period, I mean, the, uh, the period of visible light is about two, three femtoseconds, depends on, you know, of, uh, of the color you choose, okay? So that means you have a pulse of less than two or three femtoseconds, you have less than a cycle in your pulse, less than an oscillation. And if you don't have a complete oscillation, you don't have light anymore. So this is a natural limit. But still, if you reach this, you should be able to access a lot of uh, electron dynamics in many, many processes. So is it possible? And then use, for instance, an X-ray at a second probe pulse as to, to analyze or to take the pictures. Well, the answer will be provided by Tomato. And uh, this is precisely what we are going to do. So Tomato means time, the ultimate time scale in organic molecular optoelectronics, the attosecond. And, uh, and why organic molecular optoelectronics? Because there you don't ionize at all. You excite with light, OK? And this is the project that Nathario mentioned, and I will not devote more time to it. Uh, that I wanted to show you the logo. There is no tomato in the logo. Uh, I had to precise. It was too. It was considered for a while, but uh, it was too reddish. Uh, I would say so. We removed it. Conclusion. So very very simple conclusion is, uh, you know, XUV and X-ray light pulses without a second and few femtosecond durations. Now, if you combine these with uh, theoretical calculations performing supercomputers are now opening the way to image, as I saw, and control the electronic motion and the ulterior nuclear motion. And if you do that, then in principle, one can imagine that you could control chemical reactions, as we are a long way uh, uh, to, to achieve something like that. And but this is basically, and this is the other message important here, you know, electrons are the essence of chemistry. Contrarily to what, you know, a lot of people have in because, you know, chemistry is when you move the atoms from one side to another side or to another place. But don't forget, this is controlled entirely by electrons. So if we want to really to deeply understand chemistry, we have to go down the attosecond. And I think this is an important message that I'd like to, all these processes you see here, you know, 
occur because the electrons dictated what the nuclei had to do at some point. So you want to know more and you are not interested in details, I recommend you to read this, uh, which was published a few years ago in Investigación y Ciencia. It's written in Spanish. If you want to know more details, then I also recommend you to re uh, read this review that we, I published in collaboration with Mauro Nizoli. And, uh, and of course, uh, we have heard this several times. This is the result of the work of a lot of young people. Here you have the list, as you can see, people go, move to other places, some of them come back. We should try to, to recover the good ones, okay? But unfortunately, many of them stay abroad. Uh, and uh, well, that's life, but uh, I think we should make an effort to, to recover these people. And uh, of course, acknowledge all the funding agencies. And just to mention that you think that, that what I told you here doesn't sound totally crazy, um, then uh, we would be very happy to, uh, to have new PhD students in Portugal working in this project with us. Thank you very much. No, no. Ahora, ya, vale. Muy bien. Eh, bueno, dos cosas. La primera es decir que en el ardor de mi presentación y, y con la idea de que no se me olvidase lo de Estocolmo, se me olvidó decir algo que es obligado a decir estando aquí en esta casa. Ya lo había dicho Eugenio, pero yo debía decirlo también. Fernando recibió el premio Jaume I y es, eh, estando en esta casa es obligado a decirlo, sobre todo porque nos están vigilando desde desde la Fundación Jaime I. Oh. <risa> Entonces, bueno, es uno de los tocados con el dedo divino. De... Sí, bueno, está... Eh, 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 nadie me ha dicho nada, pero he leído dos pensamientos. Uno ha sido el, el de la Fundación, eh, eh, Jaume I, eh, I, o Jaume I, eh, perdón, eh, eh, Jaime I, rey. Rey Jaime I, o rey Jaume. Bueno, ya sabéis que eh, eh, la monarquía no pasa por sus mejores momentos ahora, pero, pero no pasa nada. Eh, eh, el rey eh, eh, Jaume I, eh, aparte, de, eh, aparte, de, aparte de otras eh, consideraciones de, de Fernando, bueno, y la segunda es que cuando estabais sentado también he leído el pensamiento de Coque diciendo, ¿qué hace un químico sintético en un proyecto como este? Pues, pues eh, eh, claro, esa fue mi primera pregunta, eh, eh, pero tengo que deciros una cosa. Eh, un poco, pero... pero... Lo, 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 lo suficiente, lo suficiente no, no. Para, para ignorantes como nosotros. Esto es, os prometo... Moléculas divertidas, es lo único que dije, porque me, eh, ha criticado que yo dijese algo de la fenilalanina y es que dije, hombre, 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 de todas las millones de moléculas que hay, casi habéis elegido la más aburrida de todas. No, hay moléculas mucho más divertidas y prometemos eh, sorpresas, placeres insospechados en, en lo que vamos a, a producir con este tipo de cosas en donde veréis que las moléculas os sorprenderán. No podemos, hasta ahí podemos leer nada más. Eh, queda abierto el debate. Muchas gracias, Fernando, por esta charla tan magnífica y ver cómo se mueven las moléculas, que, bueno, es que los pues, electrones, bueno, se mueve todo, ¿no? Todo se mueve. ¿eh? No, no, los electrones. Bueno, sí, pero los núcleos también. Los núcleos a todos. Tardan más. Tardan más. Bueno, en el, bueno, yo hablando de moléculas, ¿no? Eh, ¿Hay algún tipo de restricción en cuanto a peso molecular que puedas eh, utilizar, ¿no? O sea, con esta técnica. ¿Te refieres a experimentos o teoría? Eh, o, o los dos. Bueno, yo más que nada experimentos sí. porque soy. Eh, bueno, vamos a ver. En principio, en. So, I mean, 
mi è piaciuta uh, no, 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 in principio, no, no, no. In principio Perdón, la única disculpa es que si no nos seguimos el micrófono. Sí, es que lo están grabando. Ah, eh, lo siento, pero yo ya lo comenté antes. Me tenéis que haber puesto aquí unos grilletes o algo porque yo me muevo muchísimo. Eh, la, mi manera la, de, de... La dinámica de, electrónica en deliberar y, y, y se me va. Bueno, eh, en estos experimentos primerizos, ¿no? que todos se hicieron en fase gas porque ya la complicación, por lo menos para no tener un disolvente por ahí que esté haciendo cosas, además, ¿no? Entonces, claro, la limitación principal era que las moléculas de, que se estudiaran tenían que poder sublimarse. Esa es la, la limitación más importante. Desde el punto de vista teórico, como siempre, the smaller, the better, ¿no? Sobre todo porque aquí no estamos utilizando métodos por ejemplo, como Density Functional Theory, por poner uno que todo el mundo conoce aquí, no vale, eso no vale para nada en este contexto. ¿no? Entonces, son métodos de independen mucho más complejos y entonces, uh, verdaderamente, uh, la fenilalanina ya fue un challenge y, y, el, y el triptófano ya no quiero ni decir. Pero bueno, como lo midieron ellos, tenían moléculas más gordas todavía, pero dijimos que se olvidarán de nosotros, entonces no se consideraron nunca. Ahora, en el, digamos, la idea... Obviamente, y hay gente trabajando, experimentales trabajando en este campo, es hacer este mismo tipo de experimentos en liquid jets. Liquid jets que eh, llevan incorporadas las moléculas y que de alguna manera simulan el hecho de que las moléculas en, en nuestros cuerpos y en muchas situaciones y en un laboratorio de química están en disolución. ¿no? Y ya hay resultados y hay artículos publicados sobre eso. Ahí la teoría de momento está mucho más atrás porque hay que modelizar también el disolvente y hay que modelizar el movimiento electrónico en el disolvente. Y la otra posibilidad, que es muy interesante, es um, poner estas moléculas en sustratos sólidos, porque eso es, por ejemplo, el, uh, la manera en la que estos sistemas donores aceptores digamos, pues se montan ¿no? en, en la realidad. Uno no puede tener un gas ahí, ¿no? una célula fotovoltaica es sólida, por definición, está en algo. Y eso, bueno, de momento, de nuevo, la limitación es que las moléculas tienen que ser volátiles porque eh, este tipo de experimentos hay que hacerlos en ultra alto vacío eh, y entonces, pues, por ejemplo, si se combinan con un STM, pues, pues tienes que evaporarlas y que se depositen. Entonces, ese es el estatus a día de hoy. Esto es una cosa que lleva, es decir, podemos decir que la atoquímica nació en 2014 con ese experimento de la fenilanaína. O sea, que está empezando, esto está todavía en mantillas, pero va avanzando bastante. Si le queréis dar un disgusto a Fernando, decirle que, que pase de 6 a 7 átomos, esto es... Bueno, es, la fenilalanina tiene más. <risa> eh, muchas gracias, Fernando, realmente impresionante. Eh, si he entendido bien... Nosotros lo que estamos viendo es la oscilación de la densidad electrónica. En algún punto, sí. O sea, hablaste del grupo amino de la fenilanalina y ahí en una de las gráficas ponía la oscilación de la carga que tenía. Al, al final oscilaba entre, si, si lo he visto bien, entre 0,85 y 0,95. No, no, eh, no la pero... oscilación, en esa, en la, la fenilanalina es tan mala <risa> que las fluctuaciones de carga son del orden del 5%. Okay. Lo que pasa que en el movie este, como está referido todo a la carga medio, se, digamos, se... Eh, se fuerza a que sea más visual, pero son del orden del 5%, es muy poco. Realmente no es que el grupo pasa de ser aceptor a no. dador en un sentido estricto. No, o sea. pero, y esto ya son cosas que están en progreso, y en el próximo meeting de la semana que viene, en el próximo meeting del tomato, habrá novedades al respecto, que no quiero desvelar aquí, pero sí que puedo anticipar que en sistemas bien escogidos, con grupos donores y aceptores, como Dios manda, digamos, esas fluctuaciones de carga son muchísimo mayores, del orden del 30-40%, ya las hemos visto. Y una pregunta muy breve. ¿Crees que va a ser posible observar en fase gas una etapa de una reacción realmente como, o es un tiempo demasiado largo? Es decir, ¿cómo Sin... desde un, unos reactivos llegas a unos productos? 
ya no me refiero bueno, eso, a otro, o sea, tan ambicioso, pero una sí, Bueno, eso en eh, fentoquímica, eh, fentoquímica en algunos eh, sistemas así modelos sí se, ha, sí se ha podido hacer, porque como eso ya lleva, eso son centenares de, de centenares de fentosegundos hasta lo que quieras, picosegundos, etcétera. Para eso no necesitas tanta resolución temporal, entonces, digamos que esas herramientas existen. Y en fentoquímica, la gente que trabaja en fentoquímica, sí que ha visto algunas reacciones ocurriendo en, pero claro, sencillitas, eh, pues por ejemplo, cómo se rompe el, yo que sé, el, el, el yoduro de metilo, por poner una cosa que es una molécula, le gusta mucho a los que hacen fentoquímica, pues ver cómo, cómo se rompe un enlace. Ahora, cómo dos moléculas se aproximan, forman un nuevo enlace, eso, eh, hasta donde yo sé, todavía no se ha visto. Bueno, Coque, te habrá quedado ahora claro que pinta un químico sintético. Ha dicho, moléculas elegidas como Dios manda, no, como un químico sintético manda. <risa> bueno, a lo mejor Dios es un químico sintético. Eso iba a decir pues... yo, pero no he querido decir. Pero... Sí, <risa> A mí me ha parecido espléndida la charla, y no solo la charla, sino lo que viene detrás de la charla, que es todo el trabajo a lo largo de años. Quería citar como comentario que en, en los femtosegundos hay una espectroscopía de femtosegundos que permite estudiar el estado sólido, que es en lo que yo trabajo. No en esa espectroscopía, afortunadamente, porque no tengo los equipos. Pero hay unos trabajos de Cavaleri, que es en, en, en Hamburgo, en el Max Planck de óptica de Hamburgo, que en el caso de los superconductores de alta temperatura, los cupratos, que espero que todo el mundo conozca y si no, pues, en fin, que lo busquen un poco, eh, se puede citar con un haz preciso un único enlace, el enlace cobre-oxígeno que forma una pirámide. Y entonces resulta que la temperatura crítica, nada menos, depende de esa distancia. Entonces, el grupo de Cavalieri lo que ha hecho es hacer variar esa distancia y al mismo tiempo, dividiendo el haz, ver el estado, el, el estado excitado y sí. eso lleva acompañada una espectroscopía de resonancia que se llama, en fin, y de ahí se puede ver si es o no superconductor y eso se puede hacer a diferentes temperaturas, pero no solo, luego con un acelerador lineal que hay en Stanford se puede por pulsos también, muy parecido a esto, pero en otro margen de, de, de vibración, vamos, de frecuencias, se puede ver la estructura en el momento sí. que es superconductor. Entonces han llegado a hacer subir la temperatura de esos superconductores a temperatura ambiente, o sea, y va a superconductor a temperatura ambiente durante 10 0 a menos 9 segundos, que no es mucho, pero en fin, es el estado superconductor. Entonces, muy modestamente, lo que nosotros intentamos es hacer sustituciones racionales en el IVACU y hemos conseguido subir la temperatura permanentemente, pero a cosas que llegan a 100 Kelvin como mucho. O sea que realmente es una cosa muy parecida, pero en el rango de frecuencia es menor y en estado sólido. Y en estado sólido, sí. Solo era eso. Gracias. Esa es otra de las direcciones que está tomando mucho impulso en este campo, precisamente, pero que yo no he tratado por, por cuestiones de, de tiempo, ¿no? Sí, sí. ¿Alguna otra última pregunta, Eugenio? Te damos la oportunidad de cerrar el... No, a ver... Tú haces la pregunta, luego me devuelves el micrófono y luego ya cierras. Ya cierras tú después. Vale. <risa> bueno, gracias por la charla. Es bastante, vamos, es, como ha dicho todo el mundo, sí que es bastante espectacular ver lo que se puede hacer con, uh, con el dato segundo en este caso. Las moléculas, como has dicho, son muy, muy sencillas, las que tienen que estudiar de otra forma experimentalmente hay complejidades, problemas, por, por no poner sublimarse a lo mejor, pero desde el punto de vista teórico también es muy, muy complicado, porque una muy sencillita, pues ahí ves ya un montón de cosas, una muy pequeña, donde la has hecho sin ningún tipo de perturbación. El campo eléctrico, cuando lo pones en la superficie, tienes un campo eléctrico por ahí aplicado, y eso te cambia todo, que tienes que introducir en la teoría también. La superficie, el campo eléctrico, tendrás que introducir muchas cosas para tener en cuenta esos efectos. Entonces, me imagino que esa molécula colocada encima de la superficie, pues a lo mejor no ves esa fluctuación, las verás en una dirección a lo mejor y no lo verás cambiando de forma simétrica, ¿no? eso, eso cambiará completamente. Sí. Eh, yo uno de los sistemas que, que en estos casos siempre me, me ha atraído, eh, eh, vamos, son los, los, las moléculas de valencia mixta, en las cuales sí que tienes un metal y otro metal y el electrón sí que se mueve a una frecuencia determinada entre las dos posiciones, uh -huh. entonces ver ese tipo de movimientos desde el punto de vista del dato segundo es una cosa que yo creo que, uh -huh. que, que sí que puede... Es, es, bastante más eh, exagerado el cambio 
que en un sistema dador aceptor en ese caso, porque sí que se, el electrón está en, la posición, en una posición A y pasa a la posición B, por lo tanto se ve brutalmente el cambio de un electrón de una posición a otra. Entonces, ese, ese tipo de sistemas, no sé si hay problemas desde el punto de vista teórico también para tratar metales en ese sentido. Bueno, el metal tiene más electrones, pero en principio no veo nada, aparte de que es más costoso, no veo fundamentalmente ningún problema. Eh, las metodologías que tenemos nosotros eh, se pueden utilizar. Porque también, ahí también, lo que la gente siempre propone o proponemos, es que hay un acoplamiento muy fuerte entre el electrón y la vibración de, de, de tu molécula. Por lo tanto, no puedes dejar no. la vibración aparte de, del movimiento electrónico. Por sí. lo tanto, a lo mejor... Eh, no es atosegundo, a lo mejor es más lento. Sí, pero, pero serán pocos fentosegundos. Eh, es decir. Eh, pero, sí, sí, no. Eh, es decir, hay un pero montón... ese, tipo, ese tipo de problema es un problema típico para con, ese sí. tipo, con esa técnica poder yo, intentar. Exactamente, yo estoy de acuerdo. Resolverlo. Y bueno. esto abre una nueva frontera, digamos, que... Vamos, en creo... mi caso, si yo hubiera intervenido en ese tipo de proyecto, pues hubiera sugerido ese tipo de moléculas. En lugar claro, de pero de... digamos que <risa> por ya tenías otra y así no por No se necesita un metal para llegar a compuestos de Valencia. No, ya lo sé, ya, sí, sí, ya lo sé. Sí, sí. sí pero vamos a ver, eh, si, si tarda, todo lo que tarda más de menos de 20 centosegundos es inaccesible en claro. Chemistry. Sí, eh, Lo que pasa es que, como, con... se, como son Fento, es menos fancy, digamos, el nombre. Pero todo lo que ocurre de 20 centosegundos para abajo no lo puedes estudiar con, con las técnicas de fentochemistry. Tienes que hacer esto. Ah, sí, hay muchos sistemas en los cuales Entonces, pasas de, 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 a muy, a muy, muy sí. rápidamente, porque con Mosbauer sí. puedes ver el electrón moviéndose sí, 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 o sea, sí. a veces, pero a veces no, a veces está totalmente deslocalizado en la escala de Mosbauer. Sí, Significa sí. en ese caso que ya estamos en la... En la Puede ser que ya estemos sí. cerca de los 10 a los menos 15, menos 18 casi. Bueno, 15 es femto, pero 10 es menos 16, 17. Sí. No, no, y puede sí, estar, sí. podemos estar en la escala de femto segundo en los sistemas totalmente deslocalizados de Valencia Mixta. Hay muchísimos problemas en química que hemos, pues, hemos estado mirando. Por ejemplo, hay muchos sistemas donde el, el paso a través de, de intersecciones cónicas es rapidísimo. Depende de cómo... Sí, sí, la velocidad sea. es brutal ahí, claro. Por ejemplo, una que estamos trabajando, que es el yoduro de metilo, eh, la, la, tú, tú excitas el yoduro de metilo, lo excitas, o sea, no estás haciendo nada raro, lo excitas a un estado bien concreto, ¿eh? bien concreto, o sea, nada de superposición coherente, nada de electrón y wave nada de nada. Excitas, normal, y tarda 10, entre 10 y 15 centosegundos cruzar una cónica que está justo ahí, y eso cambia todo. Eso no se puede acceder con técnicas de efecto química normales y corrientes, porque los pulsos duran más que eso. Duran 100 centosegundos, típicamente. Los que tiene nuestro amigo Luis Bañares en la Complutense, por ejemplo, ni él ni, ni nadie puede medir eso. Pueden inferir que está haciendo algo y que deja a lo mejor alguna signature por ahí, pero verlo en real time no pueden. Para esto necesitas ese tipo de problemas, necesitas este tipo de tecnología también. Y hay muchísimos problemas en química, como has dicho, donde está acoplado el movimiento electrónico en el nuclear y donde, digamos, los núcleos experimentan algo muy rápido debido a eso y eso solo se puede acceder con este tipo de metodología. Así que yo creo que hay todo un campo en química, digamos que hay, todo esto está aplicando a, a materia condensada, como nos ha dicho Miguel Ángel, hay muchísima gente trabajando en eso, porque en materia condensada siempre es material, etcétera, pero yo creo que en química hay casi tantos problemas, ¿eh? por estudiar y que se pueden abordar desde este nuevo punto de vista.